Hey, folks, we're proud to announce our show Out in the Open won statewide awards. And so did the book Grouse and Woodcock, Birds of My Life by Tim Flanagan. Hey, we're talking award-winning shows and a lot you didn't know about Woodcock and Pennsylvania's state bird, the ruffed grouse, right now when we go out in the open. Out in the Open is brought to you by statewide abstract and national abstract companies. For 35 years, the Pocono choice when you need a real estate title research company. By Buck Hill Firearms and Mountain Home, the Northeast number one online retailer of firearms. By B&B Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram in Honesdale, a family-owned and operated new and pre-owned car and truck dealership trusted for the best price and service since 1970. By the Car Firearms Group, the number one choice of personal carry, and the Tommy Gun Warehouse in Greeley, where you will find the largest retail showroom in the Northeast for all kinds of new and used firearms. Hey folks, welcome to this edition of Out in the Open. I'm Alex Zedock. And I'm Joanne Zedock. You know, it's wonderful what we get to do for you because we've got a great, great show for you again. A absolutely. And you know, Joanne, uh, as you know, we were kind of fortunate uh, very fortunate to have two of our shows win first place awards at the Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Annual Conference and their Excellence in Craft Awards. Mm -hmm. And we had a first runner up also. So exactly. we had three awards that we had won. What a great thing that was too. Surprise, it was yeah, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's great when we can bring these shows to you and then know that they're good enough to take those places. Now we won a, a first place award, uh, the, the Pennsylvania Elk Resource Award, which, mm -hmm. was, um, which was a story about John Hockerreiter and, uh, and in this Pennsylvania hunt, uh, elk hunt last year. He's the owner of Luke Hans Farm Resort in Holly. Uh, and that was presented by the Keystone Elk Country Alliance. And then we had an archery award at our friend Ed Burkholzer with right. his primitive bows. That was presented by the United Bow Hunters. And we did a show on trapping last year with yes. Glenn Dirk, remember? Right, we well, did. Well, that show was the first runner-up with the Pennsylvania Trappers Association. So we did rather well. Great. Absolutely. And our friend, and you've seen his book advertised on our show, uh, our friend Tim Flanagan took uh, several first place mm -hmm. awards, one for the best action photo, one for the best magazine photo, <laughs> best book award, and Young Trees Habitat Award. Hey, we're going to talk with Tim and about his photography, about grouse, about his book, and all those things right now so don't go away come enjoy great food and famous jug wings at the jug handles creekside bar it's outside dining done right for these times with social distancing sanitized stations and a staff that's focused on your safety it's always better at the jug handle cinnamon sin Fishermen use anise oil to mask human scent on lures and bait, and deer don't object to anise either. You can use anise-infused soap every day. Get the all-natural handcrafted sports bar with oil of anise from Marie Soap. Go to mariesoap.com. Order today. Hey, folks, welcome back. Uh, this is my friend Tim Flanagan, our friend, Joanna and our friend. Um, and uh, Tim uh, is an experienced uh, outdoors person from the ground up. Uh, Tim spent many, many years as a wildlife conservation officer and uh, is a master photographer and author. Uh, Tim, you started out as a, as a wildlife uh, game officer. Yeah, that was a second career. I grew up in the automobile industry with the father and really loved working on automobiles. But I met an old game warden whose car I was servicing. He suggested I take the test for the game commission training school. I did. And this was after you got out of the service? Yes. You had I, a unique experience in the service too, didn't you? Yes, I was honored to. I had orders for Vietnam as a mortar man, but I then was selected to serve in the Old Guard at Arlington National Cemetery in the Honor Guard. Was, so you did that. That was yeah, quite an honor. Two years of that. It really was an honor. So you got out of that, and then you um, then you determined that uh, you were going to get in the automobile business when you got back, right? Yes, went in the automobile industry and really loved it and uh, enjoyed that experience. Uh -huh. But then I had a chance to become a wildlife conservation officer. Never looked back. It's a wonderful, wonderful career. And would you suggest if somebody's interested in the outdoors to seek a career like that, particularly, I guess, if you want to be in law enforcement? Absolutely. And the law enforcement side of wildlife conservation can be 
tedious and dangerous, but it's also fascinating. But the, the beautiful part of that job is you, you're working in the outdoors with sportsmen and wildlife, and if you develop, develop an insatiable appetite for everything about the outdoors, the wildflowers, the trees, and the animals, it's a wonderful career. You learn something every day. Now you were in Bedford County? I was Is in that... Westmoreland County for three years. Westmoreland, and, Bed and, and then... then Bedford County for 27 years. Wow. And just couldn't be in a prettier county. It's a beautiful and very wild and uh, naturally beautiful county. You know, it's got to be that kind of an experience and that kind of a love of the outdoors to drive you into photography. So I guess watching animals at that early stage in your career and being around them, just a natural progression. Yeah, I was a, kind of a camera geek as a kid. I played with box cameras and little you know, brownie cameras and really enjoyed that. And when finally moved on to 35 millimeters and uh -huh. so forth. And, and by the time I went into the Game Commission training school, I was a, a somewhat accomplished photographer. Uh, the Game Commission realized that and for years supplied all of my film and processing to, so that the Game Commission would have the photographs from my wildlife photography. And many of them appeared on Game Commission calendars. Game Commission calendars, Game Commission magazines, and Game Commission articles, yeah. And slide programs in doctrine, uh, programs where we're teaching the, the officers. A lot of my photographs were used in that. So you had, that, uh, you had all that progression going into becoming a professional photographer. During your career as a, um, as a wildlife conservation officer, um, uh, what were some of the unique things you did? I mean, I know you, you trapped bears. That's always interesting. Trapped and processed an awful lot of bears. When, and when I first came to Bedford County, we had no bears and no bear season. And uh, Dr. Dr. Alt was uh, really working on the bear study at that time. And day after day, I would drive an empty trap, bear trap up to Interstate 80 and meet him at Milesburg and bring back bears and stock in Bedford County. And within three years, we had a huntable population. So that was a great, rewarding experience. But we also were, got to work with the farmers and deer management. And farmers and deer management go hand in hand. Because uh, when the deer population was getting out of hand, we had farmers killing 100 and some deer per farm per, per year. So dealing with that, we finally convinced, convinced the commission to start red tag programs and green tag programs so that the sportsmen could take advantage of these deer and not be lost to highway kills and, and crop kills on farms. Well, those were some of the highlights of the career, but every day was a highlight because you, you, we would see things that other people don't see. You know, we're just out in the natural world all the time, and I almost always had a dog with me, usually a Briton oh, Spaniel, yeah, yeah. and a camera. And my dogs were great deputies. They could find more evidence than anything. <laughs> Their nose showed them things that my, I would never have found. But also was able to photograph these unique things, and it really made for a fascinating life, fascinating career. Well, you've uh, received a lot of awards for your work uh, in the outdoors and, uh, and even as a wildlife conservation officer. And I think what it takes folks out there, you know, we know, we know some of them uh, and, and some people out there have, uh, you know, a different feeling about wildlife con conservation officers and what they do and how they do their job. That's a job. I mean, you know, somebody's got to be out there doing this kind of thing. And as you said, it can be very dangerous at, at some point. Now, I know you had talked about writing a book. I don't know how far you are on this book, but about your life as a as a game warden, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of experience there, a lot of harrowing things, but a lot of things that, you know, people go out there and they do dumb things. Oh yeah, and my I was a sportsman before I came, became a conservation officer, and that gave me a, a different outlook. I, I wanted to treat that sportsman I'm dealing with as I want to be treated because the, the conservation officer needs to realize the sportsman is, is his employer. He not only is, pays his, the bill for conservation, but he actually applies without the sportsman going out and harvesting the deer, controlling the populations, there is no wildlife management. So I always had great respect for the man who was paying my salary and doing the wildlife management because I came from that sure. genre. You know, I, sure. I was a hunter and a fisherman. I think that's what made you special. And your well, job. and consideration of, of other people is, you know, we have to be considerate of other sure. people. And like you said, some make mistakes. My desire as a law enforcement officer was to catch the premeditated violator. And I especially liked working at night. In this book you mentioned, uh, it's, it's written, there's 40-some chapters written, and it's called Night Killers. And every chapter is an episode that occurred at night. The number one game violator is the guy that's out there at night with a spotlight 
shooting deer and shooting bear illegally and possibly, possibly shooting bullets right down past your house. I've had school buses shot into and houses and cars shot into. Yeah, and it's just in, indiscriminate shooting. That's the fellow I wanted, not the fellow that made a mistake. A anybody can make a mistake. You've moved on uh, from that um, to your love of birds. And you were, um, you know, I, I have to tell you, when, when, Tim, <laughs> when Tim would go out uh, hunting uh, a grouse and a woodcock uh, with, his, with his fabulous dogs, Tim shot a 410 shotgun most of the time and harvested a lot of these animals because, you know, that's just how, what a kind of guy he is and how good he is. But your love for birds got from hunting to hunting them with a camera. It's, it certainly did. And to capture a, a grouse or a woodcock, you know, it's difficult to shoot one with a, with a shotgun. And it takes a, a fairly good shot to bring one of them down on the wing. To capture that with a camera is almost mission impossible. Mm. So that became quite a challenge. And it's, um, when you get a shot like that, you've done something. No, absolutely. Hey, folks, uh, we're going to come back. We're going to talk with Tim about his fantastic book and about uh, hunting grouse and woodcock and give you some tips and ideas and all those kinds of things, plus his phenomenal book. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Real estate law is our business. I need an abstract title search company near Stroudsburg, Mount Pocono, Pocono Lake, Lake Naomi, Blake Slee. Call National Abstract at 570-646-4110. For offices near Scranton, Clark Summit, Lake Wallen Pompack, Lords Valley. And for general information, call 570-226-6229. For 35 years helping people with real estate, we're a Pocono experience you can't afford. Call 570-226-6229. Buck Hill Firearms, home of the $10 transfer. Located at 916 Route 390 in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania. You never have to make an appointment. We're open 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. Buck Hill Firearms is a full-service gun shop with on-site gunsmithing. Buck Hill Firearms NRA certified instructors are here to help you choose a gun that's right for you. Buck Hill Firearms, 916 Route 390 in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania. Right next to the Mountain Home Diner. Check out the website at buckhillfirearms.com. Don't be shy. Stop by and see why so many folks rely on B&B &B for the best buy. Easy to find in Honesdale. We're making deals on all types of wheels. Brand new Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and the cleanest pre-owned vehicles in the land. For big choices and the best buys, head to B&B, &B, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram in Honesdale, where smart buyers shop first. B &B. To translate a vision into reality is true innovation. At Car Arms, we not only manufacture some of the most advanced firearms on the market, we build assurance and reliability through a solid history of quality. We pride ourselves on offering concealable, performance-driven firearm systems that exceed expectations time and time again. Car Arms, American ingenuity at its finest. Hey, folks, welcome back. We're talking with Timothy Flanagan, and he's a former uh, wildlife conservation officer, uh, and he's come along as a, as a professional photographer, outdoor photographer, has done marvelous photographs. All of those photographs have ended up in this book that Tim has called uh, The Grouse and Woodcock, The Birds of My Life, that we're going to talk about a little bit. Grouse hunting um, in Pennsylvania um, is something that you have to want to do, I think, because uh, my grouse experiences, for the most part, have been deer hunting and having uh, grouse flush and scare me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, they just bust through everything. Yeah, there are a number of hunters that say, I don't shoot at those because I can't hit them, or, or they just scare the daylights out of me yeah, when yeah. they flush. And that's, that's a purposeful tactic by the rough grouse. They can fly silently, but when they are close and want to escape you, they'll flush with a roaring flush, and the leaves will blow on the ground, and it's to unnerve you. It's, it's a calculated device that they use. Are there grouse spread evenly across Pennsylvania? No, they are not. And right now, grouse are suffering in Pennsylvania and rather dynamically due to the West Nile virus. The West Nile virus has impacted our rough grouse very, very heavily. The southern tier of the county, everything below Interstate 80, the numbers are really suppressed. They're springing back just a little. This last year, uh, 2000, uh, 20, we had a little bit of rise in, in flush counts and, and uh, drumming counts. But uh, northern tier counties do much better with grouse populations for, for a couple reasons. 
the forest composition north of Interstate 80 is much more favorable to grouse. There's, there's more beech and, and the tamarack and so forth. Hardwoods. It, it's hardwoods, but it's a, it's a mixed hardwoods uh, that's much more beneficial to grouse. And so importantly, they have more snow in the northern counties. Snow is a lifesaver for the rough grouse. The further you go in North America, the longer the winters, the deeper the snow, the colder the temperatures, but the greater the grouse populations. And the reason for that is the snow covers rough grouse. Rough grouse, survive, they're the ultimate survivor. They've been with us here in Pennsylvania for 26,000 years since the Pleistocene era. We know that from bones found in the, a cave at Frankstown right near Altoona and the Cumberland Cave just south of uh, Bedford County in, in Maryland. They've survived because they can, in the, they can stay under the snow, dive in under the snow, make a little igloo under there, stay there for 23 hours come out in the evening, fly up to a limb on a tree and fill their crop with buds and dive right back under the snow. And they can fill that crop in 15, 20 minutes. Wow. Dive right back under the snow and no hawk, owl can see them and their scent is pretty well covered for uh, terrestrial predators as well. So Northern Pennsylvania has that going for them. So we have higher numbers in uh, Potter, McKean, Warren counties, much better than in the Southern counties. Do you have to have a dog to hunt grouse? You do not have to have a dog. You can encounter grouse by, by learning to identify birdie cover. Birdie cover means a, a piece of cover that looks like it ought to hold a rough grouse. You know, deer hunters identify cover that, boy, that looks like a buck might want to feed or, or rest in there. Um, grouse hunters that know how to identify cover can walk from spot to spot, birdie spot, and, and be ready and flush a grouse and get a shot. It's much more enjoyable with a pointing dog or a flushing dog. I'm, I'm a pointing dog guy. I've hunted over all different kinds of breeds and there, I'm convinced that there is no one special breed for hunting rough grouse, but there are exceptional dogs within every breed. Some birds, some dogs that just have a better grouse sense know how they can approach it. With the pointing dog, you will, if you watch these pointing dogs, they know those birdie covers too, and they won't bother walking. Uh, they'll always walk the downwind side. They'll see a nice piece of cover and they'll go by the downwind side. If he just keeps going, forget about it. There's no grouse in there. But when the pointing dog gets sent, and he can get sent 100, 200 yards away sometimes, wow. the wind's blowing. Uh, a, a cool day with a light breeze is just perfect for uh, grouse dogs. A hot, dry day is the worst possible conditions to hunt grouse. But if you just watch your dog and you learn his body language, you can tell the way his tail moves, whether he's smelling a grouse or a woodcock, and they'll define they'll define and locate many more grouse than we will by walking. Phenomenal. And grouse are, we used to say grouse are killed by legs because there's a lot of, lot of space, a lot of miles, foot miles in between grouse flushes, e even more so today. Hmm. So the dog helps shorten those foot miles and get and us some more birds. And got some, got some shooting. Yep. Um, your book is also about timber doodles, wood, wood, woodcock. Now that's, that, I hunted a lot of woodcock because I lived in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania and there was always we always had a lot of woodcock down there for some reason, I guess good habitat or whatever, but I hunt a lot of woodcock. Yeah. Uh, and they're the same thing. They, they fly hel like helicopters. I mean, they, they can fly straight up in the air and then take off, right? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about woodcock. And by the way, the grouse has been for years revered as the king of game birds. And he's, well, it's Pennsylvania. He's all, it's Pennsylvania's, right? He is Pennsylvania's. Yeah. Pennsylvania is the only state that names their the state after their forest. This is Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania. Right. And we also are the only state that honors the rough grouse as their state bird. That occurred in 1931. And the, uh, the ladies' garden clubs of Pennsylvania recommended the grouse to be our state, about that? state bird. Even more so, the honor of the connection of the rough grouse to Pennsylvania is in 1750, a naturalist from Philadelphia sent a grouse specimen and all the information about the grouse to England. All of that information ended up in Linnaeus's hands who classified the bird with his scientific name that it, that it bears today. And then finding these bones that are 26,000 years old here in Pennsylvania, he's been a Pennsylvania resident for a long, a long, long, time. long time. Well, he's the king and grouse and woodcock hunters sort of go, to, go together. Our dogs like to point both of them. Woodcock are much smaller. They're an upland shore bird with a long bill that basically eats worms, probes in the ground for worms. It holds much more steadily for a pointing dog. So we love them for our dogs. They're a very difficult target to, uh, to shoot for a wing shooter's target. Uh, they don't always just pop up and fly. No, they, but, but they can. <laughs> and uh, often you'll hear people say, oh, they're weak flyers. 
Well, the woodcock actually is, is a long distance migrator. Oh. He'll fly from northern Canada clear down to Louisiana, Florida, all on the east coast in the, in the fall and all the way back up in the spring. So you, you can be in a woodcock cover one day and find no birds and the next morning it'll be full of woodcock. So it, it's a woodcock are where you find them, but they're very cover specific. They like damp riparian mm -hmm. uh, uh, wetlands. Not really wet, but damp. Uh, grouse will often overlap. Grouse may be found clear on the top of the mountain, but their covers often overlap, especially in the early fall when the viburnums and all the wild fruits are heavily uh, adorned. The, all the shrubs in these wet, upland wetlands are just full of fruit. Well, the grouse are there feeding, and the woodcock, they're feeding on the fruit, and the woodcock are there feeding on the worms. Some of the fastest shooting and fastest action you can have for man and dog can be found in October, late October, first week of November. The, the peak of woodcock shooting in November is, uh, in Pennsylvania, is, is the first week of November. I remember the first time I hunted with this uh, uh, older buddy of mine who hunted uh, grouse and woodcock. Um, and um, I, I didn't know, I really didn't know what a woodcock was until I shot one. You know, uh, he, he pointed, there's, it, there, you know, he screamed and I shot and I finally, finally got to see, and that was, I was very, very young and finally got to see what a woodcock was like. I didn't, really never knew that. And, oh, yeah. and there, I, I'm sure I've gone in the woods and the same thing had happened. You know, I'd flushed them or, or you know, they'd gotten out, didn't know what they were, but. Well, the, the basis of this book is the more we know about a species, the more efficient we are at finding and dealing with that species. And I want to tell the people here that, you know, we can we can talk for the next two and a half hours about grouse and woodcock because he's got all his knowledge up here because he is the master. Across the United States, he's probably considered one of the top people in in the knowledge of grouse and woodcock and their habitat, and, and he's just done so much research. The book that Tim is talking about is this one. It's called Grouse and Woodcock, The Birds of My Life. And this thing is phenomenal. The raves that this book has gotten uh, over the last couple of months uh, have been phenomenal from, from top people uh, across the country who have, even people who have written Grouse and Woodcock books say this is the best. I mean, this has stuff in it nobody else has. Yeah, many of those uh, comments are humbling. Uh, they're saying this is destined to be a classic or the uh, one gentleman said, I have 500 titles in my library, I have all the classics. Yours is number two only because New England grass shooting was the first. <laughs> yours is yours is number two. That's humbling. Yeah, fantastic because it's a fantastic book. I mean, yeah. this is not. We're just not saying this. This book has gotten rave reviews. Well, this book is a a tribute to the birds. These glorious, wonderful, wildly elusive birds, and both grouse and woodcock are wildly elusive. Most of us, we we might see a grouse walk across the forest road, but we rarely see a woodcock do that. You've got to get into that thorny, nasty, thick cover to see these birds. So they're very elusive, and the and the woodcock is so it's quite mysterious. He migrates all those thousands of miles we talked about at night. Does it at night, and it's a, it's a tribute to the wonderful nature of those birds and a salute to the hunters, hunt, uh, sportsmen and women that pay for his management. That's how many him. how many hours do you think you have in the photography in here, thousands this, and thousands. This, this is a lifetime of photography and writing work. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there are pictures in this book you won't believe. I mean, I, you know, they are just phenomenal. Hours and hours and hours in blinds, you know, just photographing, waiting for that yeah. one shot. Well, we talked about my uh, law enforcement career. When I was in the Game Commission training school, one of the greatest heroes of my life, Dr. Roger Latham, he was the director of uh, wildlife research for the Game Commission. He stood at the podium and said, I hunt rough grouse and woodcock. And when I hunt rough grouse, I shoot only male grouse. And he said, when I hunt woodcock, I shoot only male woodcock. I was 30 years old at the time, and I thought, I've hunted these since I was 12. I've eaten many a grouse and woodcock, and I've shot a bunch of them. And I really didn't know a male from female in my hand. Well, I thought, wow, what a challenge. At first, I thought he was a braggadocious, boasting man. But then I thought, he's telling me something. I need to learn something. His message was, young man, learn to see. We see with our eyes, but we actually see with our minds. And what he was telling me is, when a grouse flushes, a male has a certain appearance to your eye and your mind. Your mind sees that's a male. And uh, it's the same with woodcock. The females and males, even though they show no very little sexual dimorphism, you know, like a cock pheasant 
and is bright sure. and brilliant and the hens brown, the woodcock look the same, so do the grouse. But if you know their fingerprint and their, the look of them when they flush, you can identify them almost, well, every time. I shot for years, 35 years, with Dr. Al Geis from Fish and Wildlife Service. He was Mr. Woodcock. He started the Woodcock Wing Bee. He and I would always call our shots, and he was never wrong. He would say, that's, that's a hen, that's a, or that's a little male. And it's, uh, that, that challenge by Dr. Latham is, is the reason for a year, a lifetime of research. And that research included thousands of hours sitting in blinds and laying in the muck watching these birds. I learned a lot by hunting them, but I learned much more by photographing them and observing their lifestyle. When you're close enough to a woodcock that you can hear him grunt a little while he's pulling a worm, that's real personal. And it's, just, it's something that gets into your heart. These birds are so special, they had to have a book like this. Well, you did the book. Uh, how can people get your book? This is published by Wild River Press. I've illustrated several other books for Wild River Press. One of the premier books is A Passion for Grouse. We illustrated that, that book. If you just Google Wild River Press, this will pop right up, and it's called uh, Grouse and Woodcock, The Birds of My Life. Uh, this, this is a complete natural history for these birds that probably, well, without a doubt, it's the most total, complete compilation of natural history about these birds to be found anywhere in one, in one book. And it also is an instructional book on how to hunt them, how to find them, how to shoot them, how to, uh, there's an awful lot in here about wing shooting and shooting styles and, and equipment, um, how to hunt in, in foul weather, where it's, where it's good weather, and how to find them, uh, how, how to identify cover and, and identify birdie spots in cover. That's all in this book. So if you, if you have any interest at all in hunting grouse and woodcock, this is, a, this is the ultimate primer. And that's coming from the author. However, you know, it's coming from him. But if you go online and you look, uh, you look uh, up to Tim Flanagan, uh, it's called Nature Exposure. Is that right? Yep. Your, your website's Nature yep. Exposure. Yes. You can find out more about Tim and, uh, and his book and all those kinds of things. But all of this information, all these great uh, comments about the book have come from some of the top naturalists and bird people in the country, in fact, in the world. And Tim's got the book. You can have it, too. Hey, thanks for coming on and talking to us. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. It's been an and, honor. Thank uh, you. Boy, we could talk for hours and hours. Oh, these, this is a wonderful subject, these birds. <laughs> Not the book, these birds. They're Don't wonderful. go away, folks. We'll be right back. Thank you. Out in the Open is brought to you by Statewide Abstract and National Abstract Companies. By Buck Hill Firearms in Mountain Home. By B&B Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram in Honesdale. By the Car Firearms Group and the Tommy Gun Warehouse in Greeley. Well, another great show, Joanne, and uh, we're so proud of the awards and honored to be able to uh, receive these awards, you right. know, from our from other people in Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you can understand now why Tim has won so many awards. His <laughs> photography is phenomenal. Yes, and his subjects are phenomenal because they're not something you talk about every day, but you get to learn about it now. Absolutely. Uh, I love we that. know Grouse and Woodcock, The Birds of My Life is mm -hmm. his book, and uh, certainly you want to go to wildriverpress.com, as mm -hmm. we said, and, uh, and you can find that book there and you can see a lot of Tim's uh, fantastic uh, photography in mm -hmm. the book. Hey, we enjoyed bringing you the show. We always do bring you these shows. We're going to bring you some more award-winning shows. You can bet that. We're going to be out in the open. Absolutely.